Hello and welcome to Talent Ed, a podcast produced by the team at Chapter 2. Today, I'm joined by Madeira Camps, employer brand lead for Amazon's consumer tech business in EMEA. Originally starting her career in the native country of the Netherlands, Madeira has a wealth of experience in the talent sector, working both within organisations and as a consultant. Now based in London, Madeira oversees employer brand for the tech giant in a number of key markets, helping Amazon in its mission to become the Earth's most customer-friendly business. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that Talent Ed is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other major platforms. Please leave a rating, drop us a comment, and subscribe on your favorite podcast provider. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Madeira. Madeira, thank you for joining uh, my podcast today. Um, sure. What we are uh, hoping to talk about today, and the aim of this podcast, is to do a bit of research on understanding uh, where the power of the employer brand sits these days. Um, go back to the end of 2019, where unemployment was at its lowest rate for a long, long, long time. Um, brands had to work really, really hard to uh, gain the attention and loyalty of potential candidates to come and work for them. Yeah. Fast forward a number of months, COVID happened and huge global pandemic. And all of a sudden we've seen um, a, a global crisis create a huge surplus of talent that's come into the marketplace. And as you know, I'm fairly new into this marketplace myself, being an advertiser coming into sort of talent acquisition, and um, I'm really trying to understand uh, from professionals like yourself in the industry uh, where you feel the, t- the power sits and how you think it's changed since COVID has happened with such a surplus of talent. And what, what have you experienced in the last 12 to 18 weeks? In the last 12 to 18 weeks? Wow, that's a great question. It's very specific. I think that one of the things that um, um, I've seen is that it is still a really candidate driven market, even though, um, you know, there, there are cases of unemployment and, and people being furloughed and everything else. But due to the fact that candidates are really well informed and they have access to online information and transparency, um, and I mean, they ex- and, they, and they also expect transparency. Um, I think that they're still very much in the driver's seat Mm -hmm. and it's really important as an employer to anticipate on that. So if I look at the latest research that I've been reading terms like flexibility, but also referrals and reviews um, are still contributing to the candidate's choice and, and also maybe therefore the candidate experience. Um, Recruitment speed is still a thing, even though you would feel or maybe, think that due to the fact that the unemployment rate went back up in some sectors, yeah. um, you know, people, people are, are still thinking that that's really important. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're right. I, do you know, you know, just to support that, I completely agree that uh, while there has been a huge surplus of talent coming to the marketplace, um, you know, um, furloughed team members, are going to be brought back on board. You know, the reason why people were furloughed was because the companies did not want to lose that talent. They wanted to keep it, but they couldn't afford to pay for it, uh, frankly. Um, So obviously the government created this furlough scheme that allowed um, uh, companies to retain, you know, some of the talent, not not lose it. Um, And and when it comes to um, marketing to that level of talent, one thing that we've talked about a lot in the past is the similarities from my old world in you know, taking uh, a brand. I've got this belief, and I've, I think you share this belief, that you know, the consumer-led um, approach to, um, uh, to, to, to marketing to consumers is very transferable to marketing to candidates because... Now, they're both human beings at the end of the day. You're, you're selling a product to, to a human being and you need to um, engage with um, uh, uh, yeah, these people to, to become loyal audience members of, of your content that you're trying to put out there to, to, come, and, to come and work for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and w- what I'd be interested to understand in your experience is how closely do, the in reality, and I'm talking actual reality, 
do marketing teams and employer branding teams work? Have you seen some amazing examples of where the two work very well together or do you find they're very separate and you can't understand why they're separate? Mm, it depends on the specific um, kind of angle wherein you would like to see the collaboration between employer branding and marketing. Yeah. I mean, um, there are some areas where there are lots of touch points. For example, if you speak about the retention piece of employer branding, even if you can say it like that. Um, I also think it's really important if you have people on board that you engage with them via content and that content most of the times comes from marketing as well yeah. um, to kind of showcase new features or um, you know present where the company is going, which is produced by marketing. So in that case, you should definitely uh, collaborate with marketing on a deeper level. And to be honest, I, I haven't seen this uh, a lot in practice. This is also why I'm so enthusiastic about it and I think we should do it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's, um, I think it's crazy because like, you know, it almost seems like low hanging fruit. If you're, if you're a, you know, I, I again, speaking from experience, I, I believe that the, the employer branding uh, side of things um, is, uh, gonna be frank, quite underfunded. Um, yeah. and, um, and maybe budgets aren't allocated and as, as much as they could be um, mm -hmm. because uh, obviously employee branding represents not only the retention of your, your people in, in the business, but one of the conversations that we had in a previous podcast with Tom Portingale from um, Nationwide was um, how the employer brand can actually sit shoulder to shoulder with your consumer brand because when it comes to COVID and what companies and brands are doing to look after their staff members during such a pandemic, consumers that buy those products are going to see how those brands have looked after their staff through employer branding and employer retention and HR and they're going to go, I really respect how they've looked after their employees and I really like that. And that's, that's, a, that's a company I want to buy from, right? So this is a really interesting example of why the two should meet and, and work closely together. And I say work closely together, not under each other, because I do believe they should work side by side. Um, yeah. The fact that um, uh, an employer brand can, can support a consumer brand and vice versa, because again, we've spoken that the, um, the employer brand brand has to have strategies such as you know distribution channels for content career websites all of which are assets that would be held by the marketing team so i guess which leads me to my next question which is um in your experience what have you um what what examples have you seen whereby um a, 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 an hr or employer brand has lent in to work with um the marketing team for assets and content or have you seen um, more examples whereby they've worked separately and you've cr created or colleagues of yours have created um, their own content and never two shall meet type thing. Yeah, I'm thinking in, in terms of the whole COVID situation, right? Just yeah. um, coming up with a recent example. I think um, especially in my opinion, Amazon has a unique position at this time um, because we're still hiring um, to support our customers yeah. and therefore our employer brand is also really valuable but um, also I think that lots of people will remember um, Amazon and, and how we are how we were treating our employees in these times and if I look at the collaboration with PR and marketing related um, content I think that I can get come up with examples where we were telling stories about how our employees we're experiencing um, working in a, a fulfillment center uh, during this situation or other stories on how we were collaborating together with local communities and supporting them throughout the situation, which yeah. is then basically content that is driven by other organizations and not specifically employer branding, but that connects with employer branding as well. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, as I said, I think that, um, yeah, I was here to say this. I think that employer branding is way more than talent attraction. And that is something that people often forget. It's um, engagement, it's retention, um, as I said before. And obviously, it's also recruitment. Um, so I think you're right. I, I, I think you're right. 
So. Yeah. And if you look at all these um, steps, you can basically translate that back into a life cycle marketing framework, right? Where you basically connect this with consumer branding to, to, to compare it with the attract, sell, and wow piece of that specific framework. So attract in terms of recruitment and engagement, which also kind of combines with the sell. And the wow piece is just what I was speaking about and coming up with the examples for um, to, to really connect with your marketing department, yeah. showcase um, the latest news to your internal employees and turn them into ambassadors because that's the most important thing nowadays. I, yeah. Do you know what? You've, you've hit on something quite important, I think, actually, because, um, see, marketing for me is all about taking something that's very real and cranking up the volume, right? And or dramatizing, uh, dramatizing that. One of the one of the, the best creative directors I've ever worked with gave me my first education about creativity in a pub in about two thousand and six. And he said to me, we were drinking Guinness at the time, and he said to me, um, "What you're drinking there, you know, you can relate to Guinness being white horses and all the dramatized." content and tvc stuff that that guinness does but at the end of the day it's just a black stout <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah yeah so, so advertising cranks it up and it takes mm-hmm. it tastes really good but, but yeah but, well but, I, I think that within employer branding we still need to make that bridge honestly yeah. um I, I always i'm always really bold in this but i say that my opinion is that we are asking the wrong questions when it comes to creating a strong employer brand and we're looking for real content but we're asking questions like hey what do you like about your job and um what do you think is the best thing within the office and then you get the answers of like ping pong tables and bean bags and i like the work from home balance and flexibility well if i ask you the question why do you love your spouse you will never answer me with yeah because of the flexibility that sounds really strange or because of the bean bag that we have at home right so you're tapping into that emotion if yeah, you ask a yeah. different type of question and that is yeah. what they're doing in the marketing world. And I think that that needs to transfer more towards employer branding and you see it in some campaigns, but in general, if you look at the average career page, I just don't really feel that emotion that I'm looking for. Um, or in the example of you drinking a Guinness, I would like yeah. to get there, but yeah. No, I think you're right. I, th- I think it's, it's, it's dramatization, as you said, um, I think, I think one of the, the, the best, I, I mean, so, so you, you, took, you, you said a lot there that I want to land on. So first of all, career sites, right? Career sites are a great place to, to anchor uh, uh, your, your creative home. And I see the career site and employer brand, if you like, as a window into your world, right? Yeah. And, and it's a window that I'm going to be able to look through and see what it's like living there. And to take that to a real personal level, I'm going to quit my job that's paying my family's mortgage to come and work there. So if you're not showing me what it's like and putting those spine tingling feelings up the back of me, I don't know if I should quit my job and come work for you or not. You know, if, if, if you don't articulate an engaging, powerful, emotive uh, story to me as to why I should quit my job and come work for you, why, sh- mm-hmm. why should I? You know, mm-hmm. why, why, why should I is the answer. And I've, I've seen too many examples whereby I've literally seen a career site that was clearly um, the last thing that got thought of when, this, that when you know, the team are looking to do their whole website and it's, you click a button and it goes straight into the ATS. And for me, that's, you could do all the content and all the good stuff in the world, but if you land into that, you're going to lose people, right? Yeah, true. And there's a build up that you need to do. It's you want to create that desire and not lead towards the application directly. And that desire comes out of creating appealing content. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And 72% of candidates will research uh, you know, a company on social before they even apply for the job and get into, into, into the, into the career site itself. So, yeah. you know, yeah, you, you're going to miss 72% of your candidates if you don't, if you don't really pull them in. Yeah, cool. definitely. All right, lovely. Um, so going back to sort of coronavirus, mm-hmm. 
interesting question for you particularly because I happen to believe that you're fairly new in the role that you're doing today, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess the question I've got for you is in this role that you set out to do, was it, was it, was it pre-coronavirus, wasn't it? I started kind of at the first week of the whole COVID situation. <laughs> okay, so this is my question, right? So, so, so I'd like to, to understand what your mindset was around when you were applying for that job and your thoughts and the strategies you were going to deliver in the job before we knew this was even going to hit us mm -hmm. and, and how that has changed to what you're thinking strategically today. Wow, great question. Um, I think... Mm, so before so before I started this job I worked at Amazon already right so I was kind of familiar with the working environment and our ways of working and I think one of the advantages that we have in general is that you can work digitally um, remote completely so in terms of changing my way of working and the processes I didn't need to adapt that much um, the only thing that changed was kind of working from home quite a lot instead of traveling all the time. Um, besides that, I think lots of our actions and strategies are connected with our customers because mm -hmm. um, Amazon aims to be the most customer-centric company on earth and you can definitely see that in every department. So also in terms of employee branding, which is connected to hiring, um, we needed to kind of pull back a few things and wait what waited you know wait what what was about to happen because we didn't know yeah um the pause have a look at what's going yeah, on yeah Absolutely. it's it's kind yeah. of pausing and i was speaking about this with you know peers in the employer brand network about what to do with your um marketing or employer branding efforts and do you stop completely or, or where where do you where do you go right um and lots of people pulled back while i was actually saying that i think we should continue because um, also, in times of crisis, I think um, everybody is, you know, a, a bit more afraid. Job security, for example, becomes really important. Work atmosphere, it's kind of changing because, yeah, you're doing everything from home. So how can you create a nice working culture? Um, also, work-life balance becomes really different if you work from home and digitally all the time. And all these things that I'm mentioning right now kind of, connect it with the content that we were creating to promote and get our employer brand out there in an appropriate way um so yeah we stepped back but we it did that in a in a way wherein i think that we created content that was really appropriate yeah. for the situation yeah i love that um in fact today I, I put a post on linkedin it was a bit of a rant um uh but it was, um, I, I, I'm, I'm frankly became sick and tired of hearing people say things like, um, we don't need to worry about our employee branding because there's going to be a surplus of talent. Uh, we don't need to worry about our employee branding uh, because, you know, um, there's X number of people coming off furlough. Um, we're not going to do employee branding because our budgets have been cut, right? I kind of understand that one, but it doesn't mean you stop, right? Marketing no. takes so long to crank up. Yes. Um, they switch that machine off and it takes a long time to come up again. Yes. Totally. Yes. And if you look at the previous recession as well, I mean, the deeper the recession, the kind of bigger the damage is to a company's brand in general or the chances of, of being damaged. Yes. So, you know, if this whole thing would go over and we're kind of going back to the new normal, um, then people will not change their behavior. They will still look at your employer brand and, you know, consider um, things that they would normally do as well, like the, the glass door reviews and the information about the culture and the working environment that is still really important for people. If, if they're out of job or within a job, that doesn't make a difference, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think um, I, I, I'm trying to liken this as another example. Like, so what, what people, when people say to me or have said in the past, you know, um, we don't need to worry about employee branding because there's going to be a surplus of talent. That's almost telling me that, so what you're saying, you don't need to worry about your brand because there's going to be loads of demand, right? But like, do you think 
that I mean, can you bring this to Amazon? But do you think like when when Netflix demand went like that during COVID, they said we don't need to worry about our branding anymore? Or <laughs> you know, do you think when Apple hit a trillion dollar business, oh, got loads of customers don't need to worry about our branding anymore? It's like they wouldn't do it. So why should employer branding be exactly anything close to the same? Yeah, well, I think, you know, maybe some of these comments also come from people that are having to deal with the labor market, which has a bigger available pool because yeah. of the situation. Well, I've also noticed that, for example, in the tech industry, um, the demand only went up. So, yeah. you know, for these kind of sectors, yeah, you wrong. still need yeah. to have a strong employer brand. And especially for, you know, the maybe more passive candidates they will yeah. remember what you did during this situation and how you treated your employees. Absolutely, they will. They will absolutely will. Brilliant. All right, great. Um, so we, we've talked a bit about um, how marketing strategy and, and people strategy sit closely together. Um, what, what does the um, Amazon employer branding communication high-level strategy look like uh, to you? Is it... Is it very content orientated? Does it anchor around an employer brand? Is it closer to, to the um, marketing consumer side of things? Is, you know, Cause you've talked quite a lot about it all being one, which I think is an absolute really admirable thing. Um, what is, what is, um, if, if the reason why I do this podcast is to, to share other executives and experiences with people who might listen to this mm -hmm. and learn a lot. And, you know, I know there's gonna be so many people that would love to have that little window into, you know, someone like yourself at a brand like Amazon to go, how, how are they doing? What are they thinking? And how they can sort of learn from you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that one of the, the most challenging things is um, that we have to deal with is the size of the company. Um, yeah, yeah. So what you do then, and what I think is really logical, is kind of tie everything to the mission to become Earth's most customer-centric company and yeah, yeah. basically tie it on that mission and think about other um, um, how you can connect that with basically the candidate market instead of the consumer market. So one of the things that... Um, is basically our core message is come build the future with us. Okay. That really yeah, yeah. kind of stands for how we develop different products and services that have transformed the way our customers live their life and run their businesses, right? So um, that being said, together, we want to become that most customer-centric company on earth and building the future together. That is then the umbrella. And connected yeah. to the umbrella, you will get different kind of EVPs connected to the business teams or the organizations that you're, that you're looking after. Because obviously um, your, your uh, areas is EMEA, right? Is that right? Yeah. So, so you have this umbrella sort of brand ethos and then, then it's uh, uh, activated at a local level with local brand teams, uh, local teams in market. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it like that to make it simple. Yeah, and yeah sorry, I need to simplify things for me. <laughs> um, and and um, and how do you keep, so so how do you keep control of the messaging that goes through? Do you do you give quite free reign to the individual markets, or do you personally control all of the messaging that go that goes out to these different markets? Because I mean, it's massive, right? You, it's so many markets throughout EMEA. Uh, mm. you know, how does one person keep control? I know you're super busy. So is it how you keep, you keep control of everything? Well, no, it's, it's, um, it's different. I, I think um, there's always a central framework. And I think that every big company has this, right? I mean, you have a social media policy, you have, let's say, your, your employee brand framework, and everybody kind of needs to stick within that framework and within that guideline or policy that you've created. And based on yeah. that, um, yeah, you, you I have to say, you, you have different approval processes to, co to connect and make sure that all the messaging is aligned. Yeah, I want to um, talk about offboarding as well as onboarding and the importance of that when it comes to employer branding. Um, I know we're coming slightly off COVID, but it came up in the podcast earlier, which I think is really interesting. Um, because when 
one of the things that we've always talked about, right, is um, brands uh, create content to attract consumers to buy products. Mm -hmm. And every time a consumer wants to buy a product or comes in and receives that content, they say, yes, thank you very much, please buy a product. Mm -hmm. Now, the, one of the biggest differentiators I see in transitioning over to uh, the candidate world is that while, yes, the methodologies can be the same when it comes to dishing out content to attract people to come and buy into the product, which is the employer brand, but I imagine a, a brand and a business like Amazon actually has to say no to quite a lot of people because, you know, if you've got maybe 20 vacancies and you have 500 applicants, you know, 480 people have to be unsuccessful in that process. And um, the offboarding process, as far as employer branding is concerned, is as important as the onboarding process because you don't want 480 people to leave annoyed and go on, you know, uh, glass door or just be ba bad believers in the brand. What's your experience in managing offboarding as well as onboarding? Because I know we talked a lot about onboarding. I think that offboarding is not really part of my portfolio. Um, for the biggest part, this is done by, let's say, the talent acquisition okay. team. Um, but what I do know is that we have exit interviews and we use the insights from the exit interviews to kind of improve our experience, for example. So um, one of the things that, that I've also done in previous companies that I've worked for is kind of trying to discover based on the exit interviews if the candidates or employees then are leaving the company because there was a mismatch in their expectations around the job and if that was the case then maybe we need to advertise this in a different way right yeah, cool. so i think that that is that is as far as i touch offboarding yeah, and cool. as i said before i think it's um employer branding is also retention so yeah, in, in that sense. You need that feedback loop, don't you, is what you say. Yeah. You absolutely need that feedback loop in, you know, you know, why people are leaving, how you can tailor messaging, how you make sure you get the right candidates. Because, again, within my rant today, I talked about saying you can, you can reduce your recruitment costs significantly by saying yes to every one of these tsunami of people that comes to see you, but you may as well put a revolving door in your reception because they're not going to last long and they're going to come straight in and go back out again. And you're going to get that churn, you know. Building, um, building engagement uh, and, 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 and using uh, uh, employer brand and content to have an engaged audience tells you that you, you speak the same language, they understand you, you're, you're tuned in the same frequency, um, and, and it's highly likely you're going, to, you're going to get on if you meet and you're going to get on with the business that you come and work for. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's why I think uh, the employee brand and content plays such a major part in, um, in you know, bringing the right people into your business. Yeah, what I also have seen, um, have seen throughout my short <laughs> career path at Amazon is that um, lots of people return which is yeah, great. Good point. Yeah. So they leave and then they come back after six months working for a different company. And I've had a few um, people in my former team who did that. Um, so that's also a really interesting thing because then you can see how maybe the working environment or culture or the impression that we left behind at the moment that employees said goodbye was good. And yeah. therefore they wanted to come back. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an excellent point. Cool. All right. Um, last couple of bits from me on this one. Um, in your rounds of uh, employer branding, um, what is the most inspiring piece of employer branding that you've personally come across that you thought, that's the bar? Wow. Um, that's if a really good thing. I can give you mine. Yeah, sure. Give it a go. No, so I just really give you time to think. <laughs> I think for me, I always, I always go to um, Rafa, the, the, the bike brand. I think they do an amazing job. Um, but I, I do like cycling, so I'm a bit biased. Um, but they, they live and breathe everything about their employee branding from the content they create, the engaging videos, and they're all about making cycling, not Rafa, making cycling the best sport on the planet. You know? And then you have images of, of their um, employee brand, uh, employee, sorry, you have images of the, in their offices, um, uh, on their on their career site, so you can actually get that window of what it's like to work in there. And also, Spotify do a pretty good job as well. So there's my they're my two. If if uh, if I was to give you time to think, okay. Um, I think honestly, 
and this is funny because the example that you're giving is kind of showcasing a consumer brand okay. and connecting that with an employer brand because you're explaining to me that you know you like the bicycles and everything they're showcasing and then they also plug in a little bit of employer branding which is most of the times what kind of engages me when i'm looking at employer brands so um I liked Nike, but I, that's what everybody likes because of the commercials that they're doing. And then plugging in employer branding is kind of easier, I think, because they tap yeah. into the emotions, right? Um, other things that I um, used to follow or that I'm still following um, is the stuff that Booking.com is doing. I think that they're pretty cool. Um, I've been Which looking at Netflix as well because I just think they have an awesome culture and they have a really cool way of translating their working environment and their, their company culture in mm -hmm. a brand expression. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think that would be it. Because talking about uh, expressing what it's like to work there, mm -hmm. um, brands aren't going to be able to show you what it's like in their offices much more now. No. Because there might not be anyone in there. There might not even be offices. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like, I know. How do you articulate a culture and what it's like to work somewhere where you can't show them where they're going to work? You know, you can't show them a place, you know, sitting with their cat at home, you know? So, like, um, I, th I think branding and, and content is going to be a very useful tool. And this point has been backed up by a, a something I published on Reconteur, um recently. And... Um, you know, content and employee branding is going to play, to play a massive role in showcasing this is where you're going to work. These are the type of people you're going to work with. This is what it's going to feel like working here. So, you know, I think that um, I think employee branding, marketing and content is going to play a bigger role once coronavirus starts to, you know, we start to win the battle with coronavirus. Yeah, I think it already started playing a bigger role, but it's also challenging for for the employer brand peers to translate just the things that you're explaining right now. And that was one of the things that we need to think about as well. Like, oh, well, we want to explain how it is to work in a specific role. We can't go to the office. How do we record this? How do we translate this? So, yeah, we'll see. Awesome. Madeira, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know you're super, super busy. Um, so I really right. appreciate your support. And I know that the, the guys listening to this will be equally appreciative of, of the insights you've given to, to your world and the Amazon world. So thanks again. Sure. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> it was cool. great. Thanks.